everyone, welcome to Stan the Wine Man TV. I am your host, Stan Rattan, and this is the Blue Collar Wine Show, where my goal is to help you spend your wine dollars wisely. When you're looking into Cabernet Sauvignon that runs, all of them run, well, let me see here. I wrote it down. Well, all of them run over 20 bucks. The ones I'm going to review today, you start thinking about spending your wine dollars wisely. Are they worth more than twenty dollars? I know there's a lot of you out there that you strive, you try really hard to find wines that you know are under ten dollars. Uh, I think Fred Franzia, for those of you who don't know, who that is he started Franzia's. He's the <laughs> excuse me. He's the guy behind uh, Charles Shaw wines. You know the ones that they sell at Trader Joe's. He's behind a lot of wines, and he made that comment. Of course, it's been taken out of context. He knows there's wines out there that are are definitely worth more than ten dollars but a lot of people have grabbed onto that and sort of say you know if it's under not under ten dollars not under fifteen dollars you're spending too much money now I disagree with that entirely because there's a lot of great wines that are a lot more than that and I've tasted a lot of great wines that are a lot more than that I do like to find and I'm very well known in my little neck of the woods for finding great wines under fifteen dollars but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate wines that are more than that. And so, and I've said this many times, being blue collar doesn't mean you're looking for cheap wines. It means you want to spend those dollars that you get and that you're spending your money on for wine to be spent wisely, in a nutshell. So, I have three Washington State wines here today to try and we'll see how they are. And the really cool thing about these wines is they're all from different areas of eastern Washington. The, the grape sources are, of course. And um, I, the reason I'm doing Washington Cab, I did Washington Merlot was my last episode. And I just missed March. I mean, for, I was busy. I had a lot going on in my life. Big life changes for me personally. And it really hindered me from finding a spot to shoot my videos. Now I got my great little bar set up here in the garage cool place to shoot a video i love it i like the backdrop i like everything about it hopefully the sound comes out on this camcorder i'm really struggling with the sound of this i'm not sure what it is that is interfering with the sound could be the, could be the cell phone could be a lot of different things but i've had some sound troubles and it's really irritating me and i'm trying to figure out what it is that is causing it we're going to start off with a wine called luke it is luke I know, it just says Luke's Wines. And interesting, it's uh, bottled in Mattawa. And for those of us who know Washington State, Mattawa is a Waluke wine company. It does a ton of wines for many different wineries. Big company uh, over in Mattawa. It's the only facility for making wine over there. So a lot of these smaller guys will use that crush facility, that winemaking facility, to make their wines. This is Luke Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon, excuse me, 2012, while Luke Slope, Columbia Valley. There you go. All right. This rolls in at $22. So, you know, it's fairly inexpensive for Cabernet Sauvignon. And by the way, for those of you who, who do not know this, I know most of you do, of course, uh, Cab is the number one red selling wine in the United States. Still beat out by Chardonnay is the number one varietal in the United States, at least last time I checked. But Cab is king in the reds, always has been for a long, long time. Let's see what we get on the nose. So I like the nose on this. It's got that kind of a, almost like cedar, cherry, tobacco. A little on the cool side. Got to kind of pay attention to that when I shoot these videos in here. Not bad though. The tobacco comes through really well, and so to get a little bit of red current. It's got a dusty element, kind of like a dusty cedar board, which is kind of cool. Let's see what we get on the palate. That'll mess up the sound. Sorry about that. Okay. 
So what I like about this cab immediately is that it's not a fruit bomb. It has real good structure. It's got a little spicy characteristic going on to it. A little bit of black pepper coming through. The tannins are a little bit of grainy, if that makes sense to you. They're not like polished tannins. And for a lot of you cab drinkers, you like that. I know I like that in my cab sometimes. I don't mind a polished cab, but it's nice when it shows a little bit of that kind of gritty characteristic of, with the tannins. I like the charcoal that comes through on the mid palate. A lot of tobacco. This is a very nice cab for those of you who like that style. It has the fruit. I get the currants. I get the cherries uh, coming through. Get a little bit of licorice. But I really like that kind of charcoal, kind of tobacco-y thing on the, in the mid palate and on the finish. It kind of hangs on there with that black pepper coming through. That's really cool. I like that. For 22 bucks, this is a great cab. And what I see with this cab is it would be really nice with, you know, steak, uh, stews, your barbecue, and it would even go with chicken because it's not super tannic, but it has that kind of grittiness to it that I like. even get a little blueberry coming through just barely but it's there so you know what makes a, a cab a good cab well there's a lot of different elements in making a good cab this is a little thin on the finish you know not super powerful but I like the black pepper and uh, the tobacco coming through but really what makes a good cab is what you like in a cab I can't tell you what to like in a cab everybody has different levels that they're looking for but for twenty two dollars I think I'm going to go B on this wine. I think it's a really good value and you know, good wine and a good cab. And it has a lot of the characteristics you're looking for in cab. And it's not a fruit bomb. I really, really don't like it when cab goes to the fruit bomb. Almost like a Zinfandel-like Zinfandel -like cab. Really kind of bothers me because that's not what you're looking for when you're looking for a Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's a good score. I mean, a good grade. B. 22 bucks. Let's move on. To the Powers Coyote Vineyard. Always like that. Really cool when they mention the specific vineyard. So you're really getting a terroir driven wine. This is also out of Waluke Slope, and it's a specific vineyard in Waluke Slope. And uh, this is a 2012 reserve, and let's see, it goes for $22 also. Really cool la label. Hope you can see that label. It's a little dark there, but there it is. Rinse. <clears throat> I really think it's cool there's so many areas now in eastern Washington uh, different appellations and um, they really do show a lot of uh, characteristics as far as terroir goes and terroir is just a French word but it's really um, a combination of dirt climate and of course a winemaker has a lot to do with it. Winemaking methods can screw up terroir. In other words, some winemakers, because of the things that they do, can mask the real elements of the environment in which the grapes are grown. And don't let anybody ever tell you that grapes don't express their environment. Because well, there's a lot of examples, I won't go into all of them, but one of the classic examples is wines picking up eucalyptus characteristics because they are grown near eucalyptus trees. And classic example is Chablis, uh, Chardonnay out of um, northern, out of Burgundy. <laughs> northern Burgundy is what I was going to say. Picks up all those characteristics of the uh, fossilized seashells and the chalkiness of the soil. It's all expressed in those wines. So, terroir is a real thing. And I still don't understand the debate. I mean, I don't know. People have way too much time on their hands if they have to debate that subject. Let's see what we get on the nose with the Powers 2012 Coyote Vineyard Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve while Luke Slope. So this has a lot 
a lot of uh, perfumed elements on the nose. I get tobacco, I get currants, I get cherries. I'm getting a lot of black licorice on the nose. And a little bit of that dusty characteristic that I got on the other cab. Let's see what we get on the palate. The tannins are a little bit tighter on this one. I get a little bit of leather and almost like a grippiness on the finish, which is really interesting. Much more serious cab, same price. Uh, but it has an interesting, uh, there's good acidity on this cab. It brightens it up on the palate and it gives it almost like a, I get like a meat marinade sort of thing going on. A little bit of blood. Yeah, really interesting. Almost like a, almost getting like a dill pickle juice thing going on, which is uh, quite interesting. Now, don't let it throw you off. It's it's barely it, it's blended in nicely with the uh, tobacco, with the cherries, with the currants. A little bit more grippy on the backside. This is an entirely different animal than the Luke, which is curious because they're both from a Luke Slope. But once again, this is a specific vineyard that uh, the Powers Winery. Bless his soul, Bill Powers passed away. It was last year. Great guy. This is his fingerprint on the label. Kind of cool. Real pioneer in Washington winemaking. A lot of intensity. A lot of acidity. I like it, but it's kind of, it's a different cap, very different. Um, the acid, I think, is what kicks up that fruit and gives it almost that dill pickle sort of interesting uh, characteristic on the back of the mid palate and the finish. And also has a little bit of charcoal like the other one and also some tobacco coming through on the back end. I'm not sure everyone is going to like this cab. I, I think it's a little youthful yet. It's a 2012 but I think it could use a little bit of time in the bottle. I would give it a couple more years, maybe two to five years, and it might uh, uh, mellow out just a little bit on that acid side. But I'm gonna go B on that one too. I don't see it as being that much better than the Luke. Um, they're the same price. I think they're the same price. They're about the same quality, just totally different animals. And that's the thing. Hopefully when you go into a store, you have a worthy, worthy wine steward that is able to lead you and give you good direction because I wouldn't sell that cab to everybody but there's some guys I know that would really like it some folk <laughs> guys all right let's move on to the Terra Blanca 2009 signature series Cabernet Sauvignon Red Mountain Terra Blanca State Vineyard. So there you go. This rolls in at $40. Now we did the Merlot in the last episode, and I really like that Merlot. And this is their signature series. They're, they're famous for their Onyx, Terra Blanca Onyx, and you've probably heard of it. Um, it's fairly expensive. I think it gets a little over 50 bucks a bottle. And that's kind of their signature blend that they do. Let's see what we get on the nose. Interesting, this has a lot of wood on the nose. I'm getting a lot of oak characteristics. A little bit of licorice. It's almost like it, 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 it interesting, it leads, it's got like black currants, but it leads to the plummy edge on this wine, which I find quite interesting. And the, I get really dark cherries coming through. Let's see what we get on the palate.
This is so classic Red Mountain. If you haven't really dove into Red Mountain you know, fruit and wines, I think you're really missing out. I consider it one of the premier wine growing regions in the state of Washington. It's right up there with Walla Walla. I know I kind of bash Walla Walla. I didn't really bash Walla Walla, but I thought some of the wines are overrated. Walla Walla has done a good job of getting themselves in that position as premier wines of Washington. I think Red Mountain is not too far behind them. I think a lot of you are going to appreciate it. Further down the road, it will become one of the premier wine growing regions, if not the premier wine growing region in the state of Washington. It has that classic kind of red, it just reminds me of red earth flavors to it. This has a lot of licorice going on, a lot of blueberry, a lot of currants. And I have to say, what I really like about this wine, it's tight. It is also tight. What I say, I did say the vintage in 2009. It's still tight. It's an 09. It's got some life left in it. This also has good acid, but it's not quite as bright as the Coyote Vineyard from Powers. But it has a nice freshness on the finish, which, you know, is kind of curious, and, and I know a lot of you like that. Uh, great with food. Any Either one of those two calves would be awesome with food. The look could obviously be the food, but it would be a good burger, pizza, wine, uh, good by itself. But both of these wines really would do better with some sort of a, uh, a dish, like a meat dish or something like that. The licorice is incredible. I mean, it reminds me of kind of like that panda licorice, you know, not the, the candied store-bought vine licorice. Oh, they're all store-bought. Um, no, you know what I mean. More like the natural licorice. It has that really strong licorice. Currants, blueberries, blueberries coming through. And a little bit of an herbaceousness on the palate. You get a little bit of that kind of like blackberry branch, tomato leaf thing going on. But it's very subdued, making it kind of, giving it a complexity that is really nice. I like this wine a lot. But once again, the Merlot that I tasted in the last episode really stood out. From the other two. This one is very good, but I'm going to have to go B plus A minus. I'm not going to get really carried away with this wine. Uh, it's $40, not chump change, uh, but I think you're getting your $40 worth. I, I would, I'd feel real comfortable paying $40 for, for that. Absolutely. Thanks for watching, and if you keep watching, I'll keep helping you spend your wine dollars wisely. Mm -hmm.